Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dmitry Khan. I'm a freelance full stack developer. It to Solutions is well, basically my sole proprietorship uh, company. And uh, currently working at Netherlands Spurway, which is Dutch Railways. Um, I have uh, quite some experience with uh, the product of WSO2 from my uh, previous uh, client, which was one of uh, Dutch ministries. And uh, this product is popular with uh, uh, Dutch government. So, um, yeah, let's first start with the uh, concept of um, an identity server. Who is here uh, familiar with this uh, term? Okay, so not much. Um, um, yeah, for the rest, uh, I would explain it in a very uh, uh, yip way. It's, uh, imagine you have um, a bunch of users in your organization. And you have a multitude of applications, most of which you didn't develop. And uh, you need to link ones to the others. And uh, well, <clears throat> you can imagine that uh, it uh, involves a lot of things, um, like uh, role management, permission management, people moving in and out of your organization, um, people moving to different departments, which also influences uh, their permissions. Um, and you want ideally, to manage this all uh, centrally. So this is uh, exactly when uh, an identity server uh, comes in handy. Um, well, that's exactly the thing that allows you to, to uh, manage the list of people, users, and roles uh, in a centralized way. It also takes over authentication requests and login requests, so providing some kind of user interface uh, for logging in and for other things, uh, which we'll see later. And, um, well, I can assure that that uh, entails a lot of things. So you can um, expect that such a component would need to implement a bunch of uh, protocols on the technical side, all the things on the left, uh, you have two major uh, single sign-on protocols like SAML2 and OpenID Connect. Um, you have things like uh, one-time passwords, multi-step authentication. Uh, you need to integrate probably with other identity providers. But at the same time, you also need to comply with the things on the right. So the uh, infamous GPR, GDPR, which came into effect recently in Europe, uh, in other territories, you need to comply with local le legislation as well. Uh, you need to manage user consents to things like terms and conditions. And uh, this whole thing needs to be auditable as well because, uh, well, you're giving people access to some critical parts of your infrastructure. And uh, that's not all because you also need to implement some useful functionality for your users, like resetting um, forgotten passwords. Uh, periodic password change, uh, account administration, and so on. So, uh, yeah, if you think of it as an enormous task. Um, but there's good news. You have two um, uh, options for uh, just reusing which you can, can choose from, just pick it up. And uh, two open source projects which are Keyclock and WSO2 identity server, widely adopted enterprise-grade identity management solutions. So let's uh, have a closer look at them. Uh, let's start off with some basic information about these two products. Um, Keyclock is currently being developed by JBoss, which is a division of Red Hat. And uh, WSO2 uh, identity server is being developed by, well, WSO2. Uh, both are American corporations. Um, Keycloak is the uh, first release of 2014, which is a bit younger than uh, WSO2 from 2008. That's at least the information that I managed to dig. Uh, both are redistributed under the terms of Apache License 2.0, which is pretty unrestrictive and allows for commercial use. Both are written in Java, and both run on some middleware, which is Wildfly in case of Keycloak, or WSO2 Carbon in case of the identity server. Um, 
if you plan to use software for your business, you will definitely consider the commercial support option. And um, well, the thing is, the key clock is a, is a community version of a paid Red Hat product called RH SSO. Uh, and you can only get commercial support for that one. The price has started $8,000 per year. And uh, the community version never gets patched, unfortunately. For WSO2, you can buy a product just for the identity server, but it is a bit more costly, about 20K per year, euros, for which you get updates and incident support. Otherwise, the community version doesn't get patches either. Uh, and if you're interested in trying these things out, it's extremely easy in terms of uh, if you want to try key clock out, you just need a single Docker command, which is on the screen. Uh, for WSO2, um, unfortunately, you don't find uh, public Docker registries, but you can download a binary package and install it, which is not that difficult either. Um, so the rest of my presentation will be uh, comparing functionality uh, one by one on the uh, topics displayed here. That's the one that I picked. That uh, yeah, just just the very basics of it. And um, let's start with users and roles. It's a fundamental uh, concept to identity manager. So obviously, it's uh, well supported by both of them. Uh, Keycloak also uh, has uh, the notion of groups. Uh, which uh, allow you to assign uh, attributes to multiple users. Next one up is user stores. A user store is um, a component that allows you to persist users and roles. And um, both servers out of the box uh, configured to use the uh, embedded H2 database, uh, but um, they both discourage you from using that in production. Uh, Keycloak offers only one persistence option and a single data source. Uh, WSO2 allows you to configure as many data sources as you like. And uh, you can mix and match basically various units, such as LDAP or even another identity server for persistence. Mm, single sign-on, that's one of the main reasons probably you'll want an identity server because it allows a user to authenticate only once and uh, get access to multiple applications relying on that server. Both SSO protocols are uh, well supported by these two products. However, there's uh, some uh, terminology difference. Um, Keycloak calls uh, the relying applications clients and uh, WSO2 calls them service providers. But essentially the same thing. Um, attribute mapping, that is something that you would uh, need if you have diverse applications, because uh, different applications call the same things uh, differently, like last name and surname. So for that purpose, you uh, might want to map some user attributes to uh, different entities. And uh, it's well supported by both of them. Uh, identity federation is a slightly more uh, complex topic. Um, it means relying on another identity provider for, uh, for example, another identity server uh, for authenticating your users. Um, so we are all familiar with uh, things like uh, social logging via Facebook or Twitter. That's exactly the identity federation. Uh, both servers do support external identity providers including social ones. But uh, WSO2 uh, allows you to configure them in a slightly more flexible way, so uh, per application. Um, identity provisioning, next one up. In simple terms, identity provisioning means creating users on the fly as they are authenticated. And uh, it comes in two flavors. It's either inbound or outbound. Inbound meaning uh, you create users locally after they're authenticated externally. Outbound meaning uh, you create users elsewhere after they're authenticated locally. Uh, 
key clock only supports the first flavor, and uh, WSO2 supports both uh, variants of uh, user provisioning. You can configure this uh, per application, and uh, it also has support for the scheme protocol, which is a system for uh, cross-domain identity management. Um, Multi-tenancy. Multi-tenancy is a bit controversial way of creating virtual identity servers within a single server instance. Uh, well, the main reason why you would want to have the, such a setup is a cheaper implementation. Both servers do support this mechanism, although um, Keycloak calls them realms and uh, uh, WC2 calls them tenants. Um, Keycloak also s allows you to, to a bit more easily manage your different tenants because with WC2 you need to log in as tenant admin every time you need to make changes to that tenant. Um, Next one up is uh, one-time passwords. Uh, it's a well-known security enhancement that you can implement, and it's uh, often a part of uh, multi-step authentication flow, which I will show in the next slide. Uh, both servers support uh, time-based passwords. Uh, however, uh, WSO2 does not support counter-based passwords. Uh, both support Google Authenticator, which is uh, uh, basically a standard time-based password implementation. And the WSO2 also allows you to send the generated passwords via SMS or uh, email. And uh, the next uh, building block, uh, the last building block basically, that's the multi-step authentication. Um, multi-step authentication is used for uh, two purposes. It's either uh, enhancing security uh, just like uh, the one-time passwords that I just mentioned. Or uh, you can impose specific actions on the user, such as password updates after the, uh, after the user logs in. So the implementation of key clock is a bit limited. Uh, the only security enforcement here is a one-time password. And um, the rest is just a set of uh, some predefined actions that you can mandate the user to execute. And the flows in uh, WSO2 are extremely flexible, so you can uh, basically cook up any imaginable sequence of uh, steps, but uh, it comes at the price of some complexity. So, um, yeah, let's summarize what we've uh, seen so far. My conclusion says that uh, key clock is uh, a bit easier to configure. Um, it's a bit more user-friendly uh, and uh, has uh, more modern UI. Uh, it's also cheaper in terms of commercial support. WSO2 is uh, much more involved in terms of installation and configuration. Uh, requires much more knowledge to um, be able to do things properly. Uh, it's quite pricey. And, uh, well, I believe it can offer just about anything in terms of functionality. Um, so um, if your application landscape is uh, very diverse and complex, uh, I would choose the WSO2 product, and otherwise I would just go with Keycloak. Um, yeah, so that's about it. Thank you for your attention.